Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, yep, we're gonna be doing more CRT related videos. And I know everyone's probably groaning because I do a lot of these, but I just love CRTs. And I picked up a new toy that relates to CRTs that I would like to show off on the channel. And also I'm gonna be focusing on this monitor here which is kind of like the holy grail of monitors. Not this one per se, but what this monitor is, is let me have wrote it down on a post-it note what it is. It's a Mitsubishi AUM1381A, as in alpha. This monitor here, which is just a 13 inch standard VGA monitor from the early 90s, it's actually not so standard. This is a multi-scan, multi-frequency monitor, also known as a multi-sync monitor. And what makes this different than most typical VGA monitors is that it basically supports pretty much everything. It can do NTSC, PAL, RGB, composite, digital RGB, including EGA, monochrome, CGA, and then VGA. It's analog RGB input supports all the way from the 15 kilohertz range, like an Amiga, all the way up to, I think, 800 by 600 or thereabouts but pretty much all of the other weird frequencies in between, this thing can sync up to. As this is just the intro, I don't wanna to talk too much about this monitor, but I will mention that this thing has a problem. Electronically, it works great, but this CRT in here is very tired. This thing had a lot of use, and therefore it has a very dim picture that is not pleasing to me at least, so I don't like to use it. So that's why I wanna try rejuvenating this thing. So without further ado, let's get right to it. As I'd mentioned from the front, this thing is pretty bog standard. It just looks like a very simple, regular VGA monitor but looks are deceiving, at least in the case of this monitor. You'll see down here, it's a Mitsubishi Diamond Scan, which was a brand name they put on their VGA monitors and stuff like that. This doesn't really give anything away. From a control perspective on the front, we have the power button here, and on the bottom right here, there are two controls for brightness and contrast, and that's it for the front of the monitor. And the fact that this is a Mitsubishi CRT is given away by the slight blue tint to the gray phosphor that you see on the screen while it's off. If you compare it to this Toshiba TV back here, this has a kind of a brown green shade to that phosphor. It's gray, but it's slightly towards the, the brown side compared to the blue tint that the Mitsubishi has. From a side view, totally bog standard and plain. Checking out the back is where things get a little different. On the label, there's that AUM 1381A I talked about. The manufacture date of this monitor was January, 1989. We have a regular IEC mains input. This is a coax video input for composite video. I keep this little converter on here so I can plug in RCA cables into here. We have a 25 pin connector for the analog video input. There is a regular nine pin TTL input which has standard pinouts. So CGA, EGA, monochrome, all works on here. We do have some switches here. So video, which is composite. We have analog in the middle, TTL over to the right. Then there are color modes, eight color mode, 16 color mode, and auto. As far as I'm aware, this only supports PC style digital RGB input. It does not support the Apple II standard where the digital signal creates a different set of colors than with CGA used on PCs, Commodore 128, stuff like that. There's a switch here that says VSCAN and it says normal and auto. It's set to auto, not exactly sure what that means. There's a line that comes over from the center, so analog, that this switch probably only takes effect with the analog input versus this one here, which uh, comes from the digital side, so this is for the digital colors. And then there's an under and over scan switch because if you're hooking up video input, you wanna do an over scan, right? So you're not seeing the borders versus computer input. You wanna probably under scan it to some extent. And then there's a small set of controls here. We have color, tint, horizontal position, vertical position, horizontal size, and vertical size. So it's a little inconvenient that these are on the back. You gotta reach around the back of the monitor to fiddle with these controls, but it, they are there. Now you may be wondering why there's a 25 pin connector here for analog RGB. That's a lot more pins than you would normally need. Normally you can just get by with like a nine pin like this 
for the analog input? Well, it's because they've added a bunch of extra signals on here for controlling things. So there's a composite in and out. There's a way to switch between the composite video and the analog, and I think the digital without flicking these switches. There's even a way to do overlay, which is a lot like SCART. So you can have a composite video input coming in on this connector, and then you can overlay computer graphics on top of that, kind of like a transparency. SCART supports that exact same thing. That's the fast blanking input. So I think this can emulate SCART for the most part. When I first got this monitor, I couldn't find any information on it. And I did find this article here about the 1371A, which I guess is the precursor to the 1381A that I have. Not quite sure what's different about it, but they talk about how the monitor is quite good, though it doesn't quite hold up to the quality and the goodness of the NEC monitor, which was the gold standard of multi-state monitors at the time. They do mention the color is a little weird in CGA mode. I'll talk about that in a little bit. And overall, they gave this a pretty good review. I never did find a manual for this, so if anyone can find that, please let me know. From a cosmetic standpoint, this monitor is in mint condition. It looks perfect. I actually don't see a single blemish on here. It looks like it just came out of the box, but like it was never used. But unfortunately, that's not the case. This monitor was heavily used. A few years ago, I bought a couple Amiga 500s and this monitor from a guy here in Portland who used to work for Taito of America. That's the Japanese game company that made games like Arkanoid. Well, they made Amiga games and they use those two Amiga 500s plus this monitor and I don't know what, el what else as test rigs to basically test out and beta test the games to make sure that they worked and were bug free. It's probably the fact that this monitor lived its entire life inside an office, in a cubicle, in a clean environment with HVAC filtering the air, which is why this thing looks so good. It was never moved, it was not banged around. It was probably used until it was not used, put back in its original box, and the gentleman I got this from probably picked it up for next to free when Taito stopped developing Amiga games and they had no need for the computers or this monitor. I have this monitor connected to the mister through the analog RGB input, and let me power up the mister so we can take a look at what the problem is with the monitor. So there's the mister menu. Everything looks okay, but there is a problem. Right away, you might be noticing, and hopefully this comes across in the camera, that this background here, it should be kind of a brown color. Dark brown, but a brownish color. And really, it does not come across that way in this monitor. And I have the controls turned up all the way, and that is not visible. It seems like whatever life this monitor had before, it was used a lot. And as I mentioned plenty of times on the channel, CRTs, like the actual picture tube, is a consumable item, and it will dim out over time as it wears out. Now, I'm not making a video about the Mister here, but one of the cool things about Mister supports all these different computer cores, and some of these cores run the monitor that's attached at different frequencies. Now, you can output HDMI from the Mister and hook it up to a regular monitor, and, and everything will work. But if you're using the analog RGB output, it actually outputs the native frequency of the core. So if I run, say, the Amstrad core, it's going to output a PAL RGB signal, 50 hertz. And most monitors don't like that. Now, the 1084 does, doesn't mind that. It works fine. RGB 50 or 60 hertz is totally fine with the 1084. But the Toshiba TV that was behind here that you saw earlier, that only works at 60 hertz because it's a North American TV and it doesn't support PAL. So if I hit the Amstrad core on that TV, the picture rolls and goes crazy. But on this monitor, if we run it, now you have to excuse the rolling bars. That's because the camera is set to 60 hertz and uh, it's running at 50 hertz right now. But there's the Amstrad core. Now, unfortunately, it looks better in the camera, but this blue background is very dim. And again, the monitor is turned up all the way and it's still pretty dim. That should be a more vibrant blue. C16 looks good, it's just dim. <laughs> and unfortunately, I have actually gone into this monitor already, this was a while ago, and I turned up all the controls, like the RGB drive, pretty much all the way up. I'm maxing out the circuitry in this monitor to try to get as much brightness out of this picture tube as I can. Even after all the adjustments, the picture quality is just poor. It's really dim, but it just looks blah. Blah is the best way I could describe it. Here's the Coco 3 core. I have no idea why it's off to one side. You saw the other cores look pretty centered and there actually appears to be a couple controls on here to tweak things. I don't know what they do exactly. Tweak one and tweak two. Tweak one kind of shifts the picture. At least it's more centered. But either way, this is one of the cores that does not work on a TV or the 1084 monitor 
but it works on this thing. This thing can sync to it. Here's the Mac Plus core booting up, and this is another core that works great on this monitor, but does not work at all on something like a 1084, and that's because it's running in like a higher resolution mode. I think it actually runs at a native 512 by whatever, whatever the Mac Plus video output is, this, this core runs at that. And that's kind of cool. Let's speed this up to turbo. And here we go. It's actually going to boot up. And yeah, look at that, Mac Plus. And of course, the Mr. emulates stuff like game console. So here's the NES running on the monitor, and it's looking rather dim. And again, like I said, these are turned all the way up. And if you're used to Super Mario Brothers, it just shouldn't be this dim. All right, enough of the Mr. I just wanted to establish that this thing is too dim. And this menu, plus the way these things, these cores look, will help me establish if there is any improvement to this monitor after I do CRT rejuvenation. Now I hear people screaming at their screen right now saying, don't rejuvenate this monitor, you're gonna make it worse, or you're gonna, you know, whatever, all, all sorts of things, right? It's temporary the fix. All those things are, I'm sure, true. But the reality is for me is that this monitor is too dim. I don't like using it, so I never bring it out, which is why you've never seen this monitor as capable as it is. It's such a capable screen, but it's let down by this super worn out CRT. And I have been on the hunt for a while to find a replacement CRT for this. And every time I've gotten a 13 inch VGA monitor that might have a CRT that's compatible with this one, it was worn out and bad as well. So I've just never found anything worthy of going in here or something that would actually work. So with that, I feel rejuvenation is really the only course of action for this screen. All right, I'm gonna stop dancing around the issue and let's talk about CRT rejuvenation. In the past, I've used a BNK465. You've seen videos on it. I think I rejuvenated a Mac CRT with it, which incidentally, that CRT still works great. <laughs> no issues at all. It's nice and bright. But I had a lot of bad luck with that CRT rejuvenators with CRTs I didn't show on videos where I would try to rejuvenate it and it would make it much worse. So I kind of stopped using it, not to mention it needed a recap and it just wasn't ideal for modern monitors as in ones built in the 80s and the 90s because it's such an old piece of technology. So I went out and I bought a new CRT tester slash rejuvenator. And here it is. It's a Koenig TR850 CRT analyzer and regenerator also known as the B&K 490B. Yes, this was sold by both Koenig and B&K, and it's pretty much, as far as I'm aware, the very last generation of CRT tester analyzer rejuvenators. This heralds from the 90s, if you can believe it. We'll take a look inside and you'll be able to see that in the styling, but they're pretty uncommon just because of the fact by the time these things were out, People weren't really rejuvenating or analyzing CRTs. By the 90s, if you had a TV or a monitor and the CRT went out, you threw it away and you bought another TV altogether. Who actually replaced the CRT on televisions and monitors in the 90s and beyond? No one. That was something that was common in the 60s and 70s and maybe the 80s. So I think these types of testers were just not common anymore. Let me crack open the case here so you can take a look inside. Marvel at the modern styling of a CRT analyzer. Pretty much all the ones you ever see on other YouTube channels are from the 70s or the 60s or maybe the 80s. But this thing has this pastel 90s look to it, which I kind of love. I have two people to thank for allowing me to get this tester. Stuart, as in the man who has donated some incredible things to the channel, like the Apple II Plus, uh, a lot of Commodore stuff, the HP Current Tracer, stuff like that. He found a little shop in Germany who was selling this. It was like an, an antique radio shop. And he let me know that they had one. But of course, the proprietor of the shop only spoke German. So I reached out to Mario, who is someone who sent in um, that amazing PLA replacement for a whole ton of Commodore stuff. I'll link that video in the description below. He is German and he went and reached out to the shop owner and negotiated the price and the shipping and everything for me. Now you might think buying something like this from Germany is gonna cost a lot more than buying something like this in the US. And actually that wasn't the case. When the B&K 490Bs show up on eBay, they're pretty darn expensive when they do. They're very rare and they don't show up very often. This thing I got, I don't remember how much it was to be honest, but between the shipping and the cost, the original cost, 
it was very reasonable, like a hundred something dollars. So for something like this that came with all the original documentation and in perfect condition with all these cables and stuff, was it was a great deal. Now, being something that was used in Germany, of course, this was set up for 220 volts. But before I bought it, I went and I read the manual for the B&K version of this, and it talked about specifically opening it, and there's a multi-tap transformer, and you can just move a wire for your particular voltage of the country you're in. But all I had to do was open it up, and I added a new power cord. So this is a standard US plug now, and I changed the tap on the transformer, so now this thing works perfectly at the 120 volts I have in my house. Awesome. I will link to the manual for this, well, for the B&K version, if anyone is interested in seeing that. But if I remove this foam here, you can see that it comes with a number of adapters, not all of them though. And when you look in this book here, this actually talks about all the various adapters that they do sell. Um, there are 19 adapters that they were, that, that were made for this thing. So I obviously don't have all of them. Uh, there are nine here. There's actually one in here. So there's 10 that were included with this. But if you notice this adapter here, I didn't do this. This was like this. Someone took uh, the, the original adapter, whatever this was, A3, and then they adapted another CRT socket to it. So the reason why one of the sockets is down here is because I ended up doing the same thing. So I took this uh, socket here, Linea A4, figured I'd never use that. And I wired in this harness and see all these connectors here and they're labeled. And then that allows me to take CRT sockets like this one, which I've taken off a neck board and I wire it up to these standard type connectors and then I can hook them up. So I personally have made five more socket adapters and they all connect up to this single one here. So that just gives me all the flexibility I need. And between these sockets I am holding in my hand, I can pretty much test a lot of my, everything I've ever run into, to be honest, uh, from the Commodore 1702 to 1084s to the VGA monitors and all sorts of stuff like that. There is one additional thing you can connect and here it is, it's the high voltage anode lead. And this is used specifically during the rejuvenation process and it's not used for testing. So you wouldn't normally hook this up if you're just testing, but it has a connection right here on the tester and then you plug this into the CRT. I don't know what it does exactly, like how this helps the rejuvenation process, but it does tell you to use this in the manual. So I've been waffling on long enough. Let's hook this up to the Mitsubishi, see what we see and try to do some rejuvenation. So inside the monitor, it's pretty darn packed. It's probably because it's able to support all those different frequencies. Lots of electronics are needed. It had a cover here and had a cover over the back. This thing is definitely heavy. It's built like a tank, but you just take those off and it exposes pretty much everything in here. So before we get started with the rejuvenation or even analysis, I need to discharge the CRT because I did have this running, obviously. I'm gonna use my high voltage probe to discharge the CRT. And I'm gonna clip the ground lead here right onto this wire that is going across the DAG ground. So this is the DAG, this part is this gray kind of black paint and it is conductive and there's a metal wire that runs across it and that's the DAG ground. It's sort of half of the capacitor with the other half being on the inside. And then we have to stick this probe underneath here. Come on. If there was any stored charge, I would have seen it on the meter here. It would have registered the kilovolts as it discharged. But this monitor obviously has some kind of a discharge going on. Or probably when you turn it off, the screen flashes white for a second, which actually discharges the CRT. So there is no charge on here. But please, uh, if you don't know what you're doing when you're working on a CRT, don't work on a CRT. <laughs> Only do it if you are aware of the safety precautions that you need to take so you don't get shocked. All right, I'm just gonna pull the neck board off here and we have to get it out of the way. So I did cut a couple zip ties to facilitate this because it was such a tight fit. I wouldn't have been able to get this test harness on there uh, with this thing sort of stuck in the way. Even as it is, it's gonna be a tight fit. I think, there we go. All right, and as I mentioned, I don't need to hook up the high voltage anode cap to the tester for just testing, only for the rejuvenation process. So the tester is plugged into mains, but the power switch is in the off position, has a little power light right here, which is off, but it's in the down position, which is off. I'm gonna leave it that way while I do setup. So we have 6.3 volts or 12 volts for this, the filament, the heater filament, gonna leave that at 6.3 volts. We have a cutoff voltage switch between 300 and 600 volts. I'll set that to 300 volts. 
We have a G1 bias of negative 50 volts or seven, negative 70. I'll leave it in negative 50. I'm going to turn the cutoff control all the way counterclockwise so it's, it's down all the way. And at this point, I'm going to push the cutoff button and we're ready to turn this thing on. So here we go. So the little pilot light is on, so power is being applied. So right now it is warming up the filament on the CRT. With the filament warmed up, I need to set the cutoff. So I need to turn this until one of these needles reaches. There's a little mark right here, it says cutoff. It's gonna be hard to see on the camera due to the angle, but when I look straight down on there, there's a little cutoff thing. So I need to move one of these needles to that cutoff. And I'm turning it, turning it, turning it, and nothing. Okay, so I need to switch this from 300 volts to 600 volts. And here we go, turning it. There we go. So the red, this is red, green, and blue. Okay, actually all of them are set correctly now. So they're not always gonna be exactly the same. In fact, um, so red is, a bit, is the highest. So red is right on the cutoff line. Green is a little bit below and the blue is really low. It's almost down near zero. The red, green, and blue inside a CRT age at different rates. So the readings aren't gonna be the same from each. And the manual tells you when you adjust the cutoff, you need to adjust it until one of the meters hits the cutoff, but the other two are probably gonna be a bit lower, at least for used CRTs that have aged, not brand new ones, in other words. So they're not gonna to be totally balanced, but that's normal. I'm only gonna adjust it till one of these gets to the right line, and it's the red one. With cutoff set, the next thing to do is we're gonna test emission. So I'm gonna push the emission test button, and this is going to be showing us now what the emissions are like. Now, other videos showing CRT rejuvenation, when you look at the meters, it has like a good and a bad range. Well, this one doesn't really have that. I know it has the red and the white and then the green section, but it's not really relevant. It's actually showing the emission as in current in milliamps, according to the manual. Zero to 1.6, that's the scale here in milliamps. And the manual says that a color CRT generally is acceptable if it's from 0.8 to 1.6 milliamps. Now looking at the emissions here, um, well, this one's at 0 0.9, 0 0.9, 0 0.9. So they're all around 0.9 with the blue being slightly lower. So it's in that range, right? Like it's, the manual says it's acceptable. In my experience playing around with these testers, there's a lot of variability. Like one CRT with these readings might look totally fine. And another one with the same exact readings will not look fine. And I don't know what exactly is the mechanism for that, but people are gonna say, well, it's your monitor, it needs a recap, things like that. No, no, no. Like I've actually taken a CRT out of a monitor and put a different one in that had similar readings and it looks so much better in the same exact chassis, same electronics, same everything. Can't really explain it. So there's like, there's obviously more going on here with an analog picture tube than just a reading. So I know that this screen is not performing well, even though you might look at these and say, well, it's fine. It's above the 0.8 in the manual. But the reality is it's not fine. And I want this thing to look better. Incidentally, there's a light here that says focus. Now there is a connection to the focus grid on the CRT and the manual says it illuminates when the focus grid is working. So if you have a bad focus grid, the light will be off. Also, this array of lights right here talks about any kind of shorts between any of the grids and the electron beams and the focus grid. And you can test that by pushing the shorts button. None of these lights come on, so there are no shorts in the CRT, which I knew already. Generally, it's really not gonna work properly when there's shorts, but you can try to remove shorts by pushing this button and then pushing the red button, and we'll try to blow those shorts clear. Could be a little bit of crap in there that could just be zapped away and remove the short to make the CRT work again. Personally, I've never had a CRT that's had shorts yet come through the basement. All right, time to try some restoration. So when you do the restoration, it only does one color at a time. This tester has two settings, 25 milliamp or 50 milliamp restore current, it says. And when you're ready to restore, you push this red button, this LED for restore on comes on and the process is automated. The manual says, I think it takes about 70 seconds. It heats up the filament and it just goes through some cycles. There are some 555 timers inside of here. So it's not digital. People refer to this as a digital restorer. It's not, it's got 555 timers, but the process is automated and there's really nothing to do except push the button. Obviously 25 milliamps is a, a lighter restoration than the 50, 
so it'll be easier on the tube. So that's what we're going to start with. I'm going to connect this high voltage thing there, as it said I need to do. And that connects right here into the tester like that, it snaps into place. I'm going to start with the blue electron beam. Set this to 25 milliamps. And here we go, I'm pushing the red button. So according to the manual, by the way, while this runs, uh, I see this, um, <laughs> this needle has gone up, kind of bounces around, it does stuff. The manual says that after the restoration is done, you check the emissions, the emission actually the, could be lower after the fact, but it says that doesn't mean it didn't work because apparently it can clean off the electrodes or whatever. And that, oh, I just heard a click out of there. So it did something. Um, apparently that can make the readings lower, but you can actually have a better picture. But it said also you could have higher emissions. So there's a little bit of black magic going on with this restoration thing, obviously. So who knows if this is gonna work okay. There's a relay in here clicking. I thought it was coming from that, but it's, it's actually coming from this. Here's what the uh, blue needle is doing. It's just sort of waving back and forth, whatever that means, who knows. But that's what it does during the restoration. Oh, and there we go. It just finished restoring. So I suppose now I should switch back to emissions. There we go. Let's see if there's anything. Okay, obviously the filament was off because they were all very low. Well, on emissions test, blue is up by one milliamp now, while the other ones are a little bit lower. This was always a little bit higher though, so who knows if that's an actual improvement or not. Anyhow, I'm going to rejuvenate the other two. First pass of restoration is done. And if anything, the green needle is actually lower. Uh, the blue one is a bit higher, as we saw earlier, and the red, I'm not quite sure. It doesn't really look any different. Let me just quickly check cutoff, see if that has changed at all. Eh, it's changed a little bit. Let's test it the way it is, just doing one pass, see if that had any improvement. All right, the monitor's booted up into the Mac Plus on the Mr. Is it better? It's different. I had to fiddle with some of the controls because the color balance was way off, and I guess it does look a bit better in that the brown of the menu is now visible. Let me switch to a different core. Maybe it'll become more obvious. I'm not sure who all the camera's picking it up, but the brown is visible now, at least to my eye. So that's a bit better. But overall, I'd say that the brightness is still not great. And I have the drive controls maxed out on the monitor, especially the green and the blue. And therefore, when I was showing that Mac Plus there, the text is just not sharp. If I turn the contrast down, then the text in the middle, the high res Macintosh text becomes sharp, but it's definitely blooming because it's just overdriving this CRT. I have to have the contrast essentially turned all the way up. I think I'm gonna just hit it again. I'll do another 25 milliamp on all the three electron beams and let's see what that does. Well, that was a big fail. Uh, this is far, far worse. The blue electron beam, if anything, is stronger than it was before, but the red and green, they're pretty much killed. These are the emission tests after the second round of rejuvenation. I still did 25 milliamps, and you'll notice the red and the green are a lot lower than they were, and it shows in the actual picture here. So everyone who screamed at their monitor just said, you're going to ruin it. it. Seems like I've ruined it. At this point, really not much to do other than I guess I'll hit the green and the red beam with the 50 milliamps. See if that brings this back. But I have a feeling this CRT was so tired it had one direction to go and that was downhill. Any kind of rejuvenation was just going to make it worse. And that's the danger with rejuvenation. But before I do my final conclusions, let me do it one more time and let's see what that does. Believe it or not, you're not looking at a monochrome image of a Commodore 64. This actually should be in full color. Clearly it's not working. So yes, the second round of rejuvenation of the red and the green electron beams definitely made things worse. Now, hopefully not all is lost. 
for the Mitsubishi Diamond Scan. I really want to get this monitor working again. Clearly, this is not usable anymore. It was bad before, but yeah, not usable. So, I think I have found a donor CRT that might actually work in here. I'm not going to know for sure until I take this apart, because it's all encased, the CRT. I can't really see the mounting tabs and whatnot, so I need to disassemble this a little bit more and take the CRT out and see if I can swap something in. I found another one that looks like it's the same size and it has the same connector on the back, and the new one, it's old, it's an old used CRT, but it works a heck of a lot better than this one does, especially now. So let's try taking this thing apart and see if that CRT fits in here and I can make this monitor good again. As is always, first step is discharging the CRT, so I'm using my high voltage probe for that. And this monitor is put together rather sturdily. There are metal chassis parts all over the place holding it together. But luckily I found that once I take all the screws out, the sides of the monitor sort of flip down and give me access to try to get the CRT out. The only thing is though, when you do that, the front of the monitor where the CRT is mounted to isn't really held up anymore. I bet you for the original service mode, there was some kind of a little kickstand that you temporarily installed to hold the monitor up. So without the kickstand, I'm having to manually hold the front of the screen up while I try to remove the CRT. So it's all a little bit precarious. Not to mention some of the wires here that connect to the sideboards. I should have released them from the, the wire guides, the little holders that hold the wires. Otherwise, it sort of pulls tightly on everything. Anyhow, just take out the four screws while holding the CRT so it doesn't fall down and potentially break. And here's the original CRT from the Mitsubishi. It is a Mitsubishi AT-14A9ZNB22. And here's the new Philips CRT that I'm going to be installing into the monitor. Installation is pretty much a reverse of the removal. It does fit into the chassis without any issue. The mounting tabs are in exactly the same position for this Philips one. I was struggling a little bit at the beginning here because the degaussing coil wire was <laughs> kind of had fallen out of position and was overlapping one of the tabs on the bottom. There were little metal brackets and some grounding straps on some of the screw terminals. So I had to make sure I had those all reinstalled back where they should go. Now I'm going to try to slide the chassis back together, get everything reconnected. And here I'm taking the deflection yoke and the convergence assembly off of the old CRT and I'm installing them onto the new CRT. I'll talk about this shortly, but the convergence assembly, which are the little multipole magnets that are installed right by the connector on the CRT, I shouldn't have taken it off the old CRT and put it on the new one. You actually need to use the convergence assembly from the same CRT. So I should have taken the one from the old monitor and kept it with the CRT. I'll address that shortly. And again, it now it's just reinstalling the various screws and trying to get everything back together so I can smoke test this monitor. Well, that was a really, really difficult tube swap. The hardest I have done yet. And it wasn't so much that it was physically not fitting because it just totally fit without any issue, this CRT into this chassis. It was more getting the alignment of everything right, the convergence right. That stuff was really hard. There's some kind of a crazy art going on with that. And I am a newbie when it comes to doing that. This will be probably the fourth tube swap I've done on a color CRT thus far. Two of them were the same exact monitor where I just switched around the CRT because one monitor was in better shape and one CRT was in better shape than the other monitor and I combined the good CRT and the good monitor to make one good monitor. And I've done that a couple times. So that's really easy because of course they're exactly the same model CRT. You can just pull off the deflection yoke, put it back on and it pretty much works great. But this, this was a totally different beast. This CRT is completely different than the original one. I mean, it's it's obviously fits, has the same connector, the signals are the same, voltages and stuff like that. So we have a good picture once I adjusted all the drive signals and cutoffs and everything. The color was great, but all the conversion stuff is totally different. First off, when you're swapping color CRTs, the key is you need to keep the deflection yoke with the chassis because there's electrical characteristics with the deflection yoke that needs to stay 
with the chassis itself. So the deflection yoke that's currently in use is the one that was actually in this monitor originally. But the little convergence assembly, the little multi-pole magnets, that I'm using the one that came with the CRT from the other monitor. It seems like the one that was originally in here was completely incompatible. When I put that assembly on there, I could not get the screen converged at all. It must have something to do with the way the electrode assembly is inside the tube, the position of things. It's just different from one CRT to another. Therefore, the convergence assembly needs to stick with the tube when you move it around. So even after spending hours and hours and hours adjusting all the various components that control convergence, which is moving the deflection yoke back and forth, up and down, left and right, twisting it, of course, well, that just turns the whole picture, and then turning all of those little multipole magnets on the convergence assembly. And on this monitor, the deflection yoke actually has two as well. After fiddling with all of that, the convergence is pretty good, but there's a problem where down in this corner, the convergence is off. And I think also in the top a little bit. Um, this part of the screen, the side and the middle is all great, but nothing I could do could get the convergence down this corner. And I think the top corner really good. I think the key to fixing convergence issues in particular corners on a CRT are little stick-on magnets that you actually need to put on the CRT around the deflection yoke area. Now, this is the original CRT from the monitor, the one I took out. If I turn the monitor this way, and hopefully this shows up in the camera, but there are rows of magnets all the way along here is under some tape. And on this side, there's just a few magnets. Oh, I just got a bit of a shock from the CRT. And on this side, there are actually some magnets right here and they're sort of spotty there's like one there and one there and nothing else but on this side there's a whole bunch right here so that was obviously to correct geometry issues on this particular crt and it was done at the factory that's far beyond my expertise not to mention you have to do it when the whole thing is running and there's high voltages and i assume at the factory the people have special gloves and they know they just know how to do it so as they're tuning up the monitor they can just stick the, you know, stick on the magnets very quickly to fix any kind of geometry and any kind of convergence issues that are on the CRT. Well, I don't have the skills to do that, but it's okay because I'm very, very happy with the results. Taking a look at this CRT playing some games, for instance, the colors are really, really vibrant on this particular CRT much better than the old Mitsubishi CRT that was in here. It goes without saying that since I never saw the original CRT in this monitor, maybe it was a lot better and brighter and more vibrant before it wore out. But the CRT I put in here, since it came out of another monitor that was working, I knew that it had a really bright, vibrant picture with nice deep colors. I think the original monitor was a 0.31 dot pitch, and I think the new one is definitely a little worse. And that's, I can tell because you can, you can see the red, green, blue elements a little, they're a little larger, not to mention high resolution text. It's just not quite as sharp, but I'm actually okay with that. This is a monitor from the late 80s. I'm not expecting it to be incredibly sharp. Now, since putting the new CRT in here, I decided to run the monitor through its paces and I hooked it up to my Pentium 200 machine and I played some games. It works fine at VGA resolutions, but I booted up into Windows 98 and I was really shocked to find out that the monitor actually works at 800 by 600 at 60 hertz. So not even interlaced or anything like that. I also tested out 640 by 480 at 75 hertz, and that worked as well. Here's the monitor running in MDA mode, monochrome mode. It's hooked up to an EGA card that's with the dip switch is set for monochrome. So it displays monochrome in an amber color, and it doesn't seem to be selectable. You can't change it anyway. Um, and it flickers a little bit, and that's because it's 50 hertz. Uh, MDA is 50 hertz. And the phosphor on the CRT I just put in is not long persistence. So it, it flickers when it runs at 50 hertz. Same with PAL, PAL mode. 60 hertz, on the other hand, looks good. So MDA does work, but I certainly wouldn't want to use it long term that way, because when you use an actual monochrome monitor, a proper one, they usually have longer persistent phosphor, which eliminates the 50 hertz flicker for the most part. EGA and CGA modes both look good. Although one thing I did notice, and is if I look and check it at the color charts here in the graphics test, the way it renders the colors, not really accurate to the way CGA should be. Some of the colors are a little washed out and they're just not exactly right. And if you look at an IBM CGA monitor or an IBM EGA monitor, that's like the gold standard 
for the way the color should decode. And this isn't really following those quite right. It's okay though. And on the back, there's a switch for eight color, 16 color and auto. And any color, it really does just ignore the intensity bits. So you have bright eight colors. And 16 colors, it's kind of working correctly for CGA, except not quite right. Look, look at the brown. It's, it's weird, but this monitor does support EGA 64 color palette which is something that most things don't use in EGA and actually I've never tested it. So I'll need to download some software to test that out, but it does have the ability to show any of the 64 EGA colors. And I'm assuming I need to have it in the auto setting on the back for that to work. There's also an overscan underscan switch. Which I didn't show that before. And if I switch it to overscan here in EGA, it just blows up the picture, which is weird. I don't even know the point of that. There is one other oddity I want to mention with this particular monitor, this multi-sync monitor. I think because the decoding circuitry for the sync signals is analog, like there's not, it's not, well, there's probably some digital circuitry, but it's not like a, a modern VGA monitor that supports all sorts of different resolutions uh, with different scan rates and stuff. Those have on-screen displays and, and microprocessors in them. So as you switch to different modes and you adjust the screen size and settings and move it around, it, it saves that. So if you go back to a different mode and then back to the original mode, it remembers all that positional stuff. This monitor doesn't, doesn't do any of that. So when you change resolutions, you have to go to the back of the monitor and it'd be nice if they're on the front, but they're not. All the controls are on the back to position the screen and to go between VGA and monochrome MDA, it's completely different and out of whack. You have pictures like shifted over to the side and it's all shrunk. You can adjust everything so it looks good. It's all within the range of adjustment on the monitor, but you do have to do it every time. So it's not ideal if you're constantly switching all the time between modes, it seems to handle going between EGA and CGA without any issue. And even in the VGA, when you have a VGA card hooked up, it's okay going between the different VGA modes. They, they aren't too different sized, but definitely switching between monochrome and VGA, it's completely out of whack. And, and actually even in VGA, now I think about it, 640 by 480, if you set it to it looks correct, when you switch to 640 by 400, the pictures just shrunk a little bit. So you actually have a bit more of a black bar on the top and bottom. You have to, you have to adjust the screen to make it bigger. Well, the final question I have to ask is, was the tube swap worth it? Absolutely. I mean, this, this tube, even before I rejuvenated it, which completely killed it, it was really, really dim. And I know that didn't really show up in the footage, but it was not fun to use. This CRT, on the other hand, while it comes out of a very, very used monitor, and it's not super good either, even when I hook the tester up to it, the emissions are relatively low. It's still vibrant and bright, and it doesn't bloom, and it's overall a million times better than this one. So it makes this monitor completely usable and great, actually. So I think I'm gonna be keep this monitor out on the bench or around the basement here, not stored away. The fact that this monitor supports from monochrome all the way up to 800 by 600 analog RGB, which VGA, and it supports composite sync, horizontal vertical sync. It supports pretty much everything that's from this time period. It's absolutely perfect for having around the bench. The only thing it doesn't do that I wish it had was Chroma Luma video input. It only has a composite input. So if I'm gonna hook up a Commodore 64, or C128, for instance, which Chroma Luma, it's not gonna look as good as it would with a 1084 or a 1702 or even that television there, which has S-Video input. But that is just a small price to pay for the functionality that this thing has. Anyhow, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, I appreciate a thumbs up, but otherwise you know what to do and all those other youtube -y things. And that's gonna be it. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.